So as you can see from the announcement just now that we, we would like to record the, the meeting. So we've, we've pressed recording now. I hope that's, that's okay with everyone. Obviously it helps us to then uh, provide this information for people who couldn't attend the meeting today. Okay, good. So um, there are still some people coming in. So I'll be, we'll, we'll be starting in a, uh, in a minute or so. Just waiting for a few more people to come in. Okay, so while we're waiting, maybe it's a good time to uh, do some introductions. So hopefully you'll, you'll see the, um, the screen that I'm sharing right now. Um, so uh, again, welcome, I'm, I'm uh, Christian von Wagner. I'm a, a reader in behavioral science and health and I'm the program lead for the MSc in health psychology. Um, before I'll tell you a bit more about what, this, uh, what, what we're going to cover today, I would like to introduce <clears throat> Uh, my panel and the other people on the, on the call because we really grateful that some of our current students have joined us here today to uh, also contribute a little bit, make the whole session a bit more interesting and exciting. Um, so thank you so much uh, already. A and we also have um, the teaching and learning administrator here. So I'm just going to ask um, the, the panel to introduce themselves and I will start with um, the, 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 the real star of the show, who is Sandra. Sandra is our teaching learning administrator. Nothing, go, uh, nothing happens without her. And again, thank you so much, Sandra. I know you're really busy with lots of uh, organizations of placements and various clinical visits. So thank you for joining us. And yes, do you want to introduce yourself? Yes, I would like to say good afternoon to everyone. And if they have any questions, you know, during this session or after, after the session, I'm more than happy to answer to you. Wonderful, thank, thank you. you so much, Sandra. And um, now uh, we also uh, are very grateful for two of our patient, uh, I was gonna say patient, rep student representatives join us. So firstly, uh, Olivia, do you want to introduce yourself? Yes, hello, my name is Olivia. I'm a full-time student currently, um, originally from the US and sitting here. Thank you so much, Olivia, and uh, again shows the diversity of our student intake. And Colby, you're the part-time rep, so do you want to introduce yourself a little? Yes, thanks, Christian. Uh, I'm from Australia, as you can probably hear. I'm a mature age student, and I'm doing the part-time course. So thanks, Christian. Wonderful, thank you. And then uh, we've got uh, one more student here, uh, student here with us, uh, uh, one of our current um, uh, students, Isan. Um, do you want to introduce yourself? Oh, you're on mute. Hi everyone, my name is Isan and I am currently undertaking this master's school school time and due to finish in September. Um, I'm happy to share with you my motivation to study at UCL later on, if anyone's interested. So, yeah. Thank you very much, Isan, and, and we'll, we'll, I'll get back to you in just a couple of minutes, because um, that's, that's first on the list. So thank you, everyone. And then also thank you, Alison, uh, for setting up this, this, this call today and, and um, coordinating. Now, um, you might wonder what this little dinosaur is doing here. So if you click on, or if you, uh, if you enter your QR codes, this is basically just the link uh, that goes straight to uh, this, uh, to the current um, admission site for the MSc in Health Psychology. So pretty much anything I say today uh, will be covered on there as well. So just uh, uh, briefly, going over um, 
and I hope you can can all see the the open day open day session objectives. Is that what you see? Yeah, good. Just to just to make sure I'm not showing you my desktop or something random. So what we're going to go over today is uh, why. Hopefully, at the end, you'll all be convinced that you know, UCL is the right place for you, and particularly also the institute uh, that we sit in. So we'll cover both of those things. Uh, I will talk to you about what is health psychology, and also the panel will talk to you about that, why it's a good idea to study health psychology, a little bit on how to apply. And you know, throughout this whole session, we will capture, hopefully, a bit of the experience and flavor of current and uh, also former students. So firstly then, welcome to UCL. Just very briefly, why is it a good idea to do, uh, to study at UCL, at, at this university? Well, uh, UCL is, is a world-renowned uh, uh, institution. Uh, we've once again done really well in the most recent research uh, uh, excellent framework in 2021. So uh, many of us have been slaving away for many years to prepare for this exercise. Um, and then, uh, but also gain due rewards. So you can see UCL is sitting in between Oxford and Cambridge in terms of research power. We are in the top five health education in institutions. So that's really very, very impressive. We are also ranked eighth in the QS world ranking. So there are many different types of metrics there. There, uh, pretty much every sort of broadsheet newspaper has its own ranking system. Um, and most of them, we, we do really well. We have 30 Nobel Prize laureates. I'm not gonna be able to name them all, uh, but lots of them are uh, uh, former UCL alumni. Some of them are still um, uh, working and uh, can often be seen on the UCL campus. Um, and we are among the top 20 super elite universities. Um, so, uh, you know, UCL is a, is a great place. And, um, but before I go on too much about that, I will hand over now to Isan uh, to say, uh, uh, to invite her to say a little bit about what her motivation was to study at UCL and a little bit about her uh, journey uh, to UCL. So hi everyone, as mentioned, I am currently a full-time student here. So I guess my motivation to study at UCL was actually driven by three main factors. So first of all, it was the academic aspect of the university, as well as the social and the career prospects of studying here. So with the, as the academic aspect of university, and as Christian mentioned, UCL has a very high standard of education, and this course in particular, I believe, is ranked number one in the UK. And there is always ongoing research here at UCL, and therefore many opportunities for students like myself to get involved and gain valuable experience. This course also offers students the opportunity to potentially have their research projects published, which is also a great benefit when applying for someone who's interested in applying because you can potentially have a piece of published work as a master's student. And for the social aspect, I guess, first UCL is located in the heart of London. So you can never really run out of things to do. I was fortunate enough to visit the university before starting and I realized just the sheer amount of study spaces as well as socializing spaces in comparison to the other London universities I visited. And I think overall, for me, UCL was just the perfect representation of London in terms of just meeting people from all around the world, as you can see from our panel. And also, as the campus is all located in one location, you have the benefit of meeting students from different study fields, which is great because with other universities that I've seen, campuses are located all around the city. So you tend to only meet people within the same field as you. And also when you start at UCL, you are allocated with an academic as well as a personal supervisor. So if you ever have any concerns or any questions you may have, you always have someone to contact and speak to. And for the career prospects, what I have seen is that there is always 
career fairs happening on campus as well, very regularly throughout the year. And even in this particular course, they also offer placements over the summer. So you can see if you are better suited to more research positions or a more practical position, especially if you are unsure, which I was before applying. And as mentioned before, you gain a lot of valuable experience from the ongoing research at UCL, which you can use to build your skills and apply it to future job roles. So I guess when I first visited um, this, when I first joined actually this same open day last year and gained all the experiences um, about UCL and the course in particular, um, it really drove me to be interested in applying and I'm glad I applied. So um, I guess that's the three main driving forces to for me applying for this course. But I guess in terms of my academic journey here, if we just go a few years back, um, after I completed my A-levels in biology, psychology, sociology, and history, I went to undertake a um, bachelor's degree at Queen Mary University of London, psychology. And in the second year, I had a module on health psychology. And before that, I didn't really know much about the health psychology, but I did a lot of research and I also volunteered with my local community um, regarding things to do with like COVID-19 pandemic. And it was very related to the health psychology course in terms of um, improving vaccine uptakes and helping people in poorer communities um, during the health, the COVID-19 pandemic. And um, yeah, so then after attending the open day, I realized that, you know, this is really, this really caters towards me. And I applied shortly after, received an interview a few months later, I believe, and followed by an acceptance. And here I am. Thank you so much, Isan. It's uh, absolutely wonderful. And, and uh, uh, hopefully uh, everyone on the call would have got a really good sense of, of some, some of your motivations. And, and, and uh, thank you for the sort of endorsement of, of, uh, of, of the course. Um, so th thank you very much for that. Um, and um, so I'm just going to continue now. Uh, to say a little bit more about, uh, so Isan has already given a really nice overview, but just to kind of say a little bit more about the infrastructure. So obviously we've spoken a bit about UCL, but UCL is a very, very big place. And so what I'm just want to sort of give you a sense of where exactly in UCL we are. So UCL has got um, four uh, different schools. So these are basically almost universities in their own right. This is a very, very large common denominator. Um, so we've got the Institute of Education, for example, and the, the, the school that you, you would join if you joined the course is the School of Life and Medical Sciences. And I think it's important because it gives you a sense of the cultural space that we, we sit in. So um, at the very top is the School of Life and Medical Sciences. Um, also known as SLIMS. Um, and then within the, be, below that, SLIMS itself has got various faculties. And this is where it becomes a bit more, uh, or even more interesting. The, the particular faculty that we sit in is the faculty of population health. And population health is a really important key term. You will hear that term over and over again, because it's a key concept in health psychology that you know uh, a, a lot of what we do our ethos is to try and improve the house health of the population to so do population-based interventions for example so we sit in a, a faculty of population health and that faculty has got lots of different units as well different institutes and the particular institute that we sit in is the institute of epidemiology and healthcare but you would also, being, uh, uh, being at UCL, some of our uh, um, lecturers, they're all expert-based. So we will be able to draw on people who sit in different institutes, such as the Institute of Cardiovascular Science, the Institute of Women's Health, for example. You might also uh, see some students that um, are part of these 
uh, uh, institutes and uh, who study for different programs, particularly in the Institute of Women's Health. Um, so what is uh, the Institute of Epidemiology and Healthcare? What makes it such an interesting space? Um, again, the, I just want to show you the vision uh, statement, the mission statement, the vision of the uh, Institute, because it's quite uh, closely aligned with the ethos on our course. So the vision is to understand the determinants of health and disease in populations, in patients, in clinical settings, to evaluate strategies for the prevention and treatment of ill health and to strengthen teaching and capacity in population health. And the key terms that are particularly important here are prevention, because this is a major focus, and I'll say a little bit more about that, and determinants of, of health, and again, the focus on population. Now, I also want to show you that actually, we sit in a fantastic institute, again, in terms of outcomes, um, and many of the outcomes that are measured as part of the REF, we actually do better than the average uh, at UCL. So no, over 90% of the submissions to the Research uh, Excellent Framework uh, by our institute were graded world leading or excellent. Um, so that's more than the, uh, the average for UCL was 85%, I think. And 95% of our impact case studies were world leading. Um, again, this is a fantastic outcome and 100% of the case studies were world leading or excellent. And finally, we're joined first with the London School of um, uh, Tropical uh, Medicine um, as a great place to conduct public health, health services, research and primary care research. And again, these are really important parts of our curriculum in the MSc in Health Psychology, which is why I thought I would stress that today. Now, the Institute, you can see, is part of a, a much wider uh, framework. Uh, above it are many different other units, but below it, there are also the research departments. And, the, uh, and again, this gives you a flavor of the type of education that you will receive. So we, are, we uh, the, the, the core team, come from the research department of behavioral science and health. Um, so our head is Professor Andrew Steptoe, and he is a co-director co of the MSc in Health Psychology. But we also have a neighboring research departments or allied research departments, such as the Department for Applied Health Research, Epidemiology and Public Health, and Primary Care and Population Health. Um, so again, just to give you a flavor of where this MSc sits within UCL and our institute. So what is health psychology exactly, and what is it not? So here I'm just going to use a, uh, um, a little diagram that was um, that shows the multidimensional components of uh, health psychology and compares it to um, similar but different disciplines. And that was uh, uh, that was first developed by Captain Environment in 2004. But I find it really useful. So. If you think about uh, psychology, the, the dimension of psychology to medicine, and then you also consider um, the, the difference between mental disorders and physical disorders, and these are, uh, uh, are not mutually exclusive, that's why they are on a gradient, then you can locate health psychology on one of the four quadrants. So for example, if you're very interested, and again, this might give you a sense of whether health psychology is the right, right thing for you to study. So if you are in fact really interested in mental disorders and psychology, then actually the, the uh, one allied discipline, but not the same as health psychology, is clinical psychology. It focuses on mental health and the biopsychosocial approach. So it has a lot of, uh, in common with health psychology, particularly the biopsychosocial perspective, but it focuses on mental health. Um, now, if you are interested in mental health, but actually want to take a more biomedical approach, then we're talking about psychiatry, again, an allied but not identical uh, discipline. And then there's also a slightly more American a construct or discipline called behavioral medicine. Now we're getting a bit closer to health psychology. 
Now, the difference with behavioral medicine is that unlike health psychology, it takes a slightly more interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary in behavioral and biomedical approach to treatment and rehabilitation. And this is really the key here, not just that it's slightly more biomedical, but also it focuses on treatment. Um, and, uh, but it, uh, of, uh, what it shares with health psychology is the focus on physical health as the primary uh, uh, focus of interest rather than mental disorders. So physical rather than mental health. So health psychology is interested in physical health but it uses a biopsychosocial uh, approach. So it looks at uh, the, uh, the social and cultural determinants of health. Um, and also very importantly, it focuses on prevention rather than treatment. And if I just give you a quick example of cancer. Um, so if you look at a physical disorder such as uh, a cancer, it's very complex disease. What health psychologists are particularly interested in is things like the prevention of cancer, the primary or secondary prevention of cancer, um, and the early diagnosis of that disease, rather than its, uh, its treatment, which of course, you know, there are, there, there are important contributions um, in, in how, uh, that can be made by health psychologists, but the focus is, is typically on population health and prevention. So hopefully that's given you a good idea, but if you couldn't relate to that, then hopefully Kobe will be able to say a little bit more about what he thinks, you know, health psychology means to him um, and why he chose to study it. So over to you, Kobe. Thanks, Christian. I think you covered it pretty well from my perspective, um, health psychology to me and uh, what I've gathered across the first, uh, you know, six months of the course is that it's got a range of definitions and uh, it can encapsulate as much or as little as you, you'd like. But for me, it's the biopsychosocial model that I've really come to understand through the first six months of the course and really is looking at uh, behaviours, illness and prevention really at a macro level, uh, as well as being able to gather data on behaviours and uh, life choices, um, risk factors, uh, and cobbled together in the scientific approach, a perspective not only at the macro, but also at the micro level as well. So I think for uh, Olivia and Yishan and myself, we took a health behaviours uh, module as one of our first. And for me, that really distilled down the fact that uh, health psychology can play an important part in something as simple as wearing sunscreen to something as you know important as uh, when you choose to have a lump tested on on your body or, or cancer treatment. Uh, one thing that really stood out for me was understanding uh, the the um, the barriers or the the I guess the delays in seeking treatment for people that have cancer or may have cancer what what are the barriers to them? actually initiating that treatment or going and seeking um, some advice. And for me, health psychology can help understand those barriers and we can help, you know, reduce those barriers so less people are, are sick. Um, so I hope that gave you a good idea of what I believe health psychology is. Uh, why did I choose to study it? Well, I, the, you know, the quadrant that Christian just had up, I wasn't really interested in any one of those quadrants in particular, um, and I knew health psychology branched out and touches all of those. And for me, my interest in what I want to do with this qualification evolves almost day to day. Uh, I started off thinking I'd like to work in somewhere like the NHS and working in a multidisciplinary team with with doctors and nurses, but I, you know, now see that there's probably opportunities. For me to apply my knowledge in a consulting role or in, or in general business in the corporate world where i've spent uh, you know the first 15 20 years of my my career so i think if you do choose health psychology you your your interest and your your future aspirations will probably evolve over the, over the course of the year or two years that you study it and uh yeah I'm, i can see it's going to help me out 
if I choose to stay in the corporate world or if I choose to go down the role of working in healthcare or somewhere like the NHS. So, yeah, I hope that helps out, Christian. Thank you so much, Kobe. That's really brilliant. So now, just to kind of um, reflect a little bit more about what health psychology is, because it's really important for, for you to know what you're letting yourself in, in, in for if you choose to apply and, and study health psychology. So a slightly more formal definition is that health psychology is the aggregate of specific educational, scientific, and professional contributions of the discipline of psychology to various bits, including the promotion and maintenance of health. So again, it's a very much around a, a prevention theme, the prevention and treatment of illness, the identification of etiology and diagnostic correlates of health, uh, illness and related dysfunction, and the analysis and improvement of the healthcare system. Um, and health policy formation. So that is the slightly dry and technical definition of what health psychology is. Um, it's still really important to kind of ref reflect on that. Um, and now I just want to uh, illustrate a little bit more exactly what we do uh, in uh, uh, and what we cover in the course and how um, you know this maps on this definition maps onto the actual content of our program. So for example, we have uh, a great interest in, 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 in theoretical frameworks or frameworks, obviously one of our major units of interest is behavior and behavior change. So we are interested in models. So you will get lots of tuition in the various different types of um, behavioral frameworks and theories, uh, including the combi model, um, uh, and the theory of planned behavior, to name uh, just a few, and you'll be exposed to them, particularly at the start of the, the course. Now, what's really interesting is, I hope you're not too disappointed if we, you know, keep saying in this quadrant that, that uh, 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 you know, health psychology is nothing to do with mental health. That's not true at all. Uh, we are interested in, uh, particularly in the balance and the the interplay between physical and mental health. So what we are almost certainly interested in is the impact of physical health on mental health, and particularly also the impact of mental health on physical health. So we are interested in mental health, particularly in how it influences physical health. As I said, population health is, 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 is one of the main um, uh, 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 factors, and so we are interested, very much interested in the social determinants, um, uh, and so that is the 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 the, the, the you know, social as well as the lived environment, for example. So there'll be lots of lectures on 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 the wider determinants of health, and we have, of course, some world leading experts in that uh, uh, on that topic, such as. Um, uh, for example, uh, Professor Sir Michael Marmot. Now, behavior change. Uh, here, the first slide shows you we are interested in smoking cessation, alcohol uh, uh, use and abuse um, is, is one of the topics that we will feature quite strongly. And we've got some, some uh, uh, world leading experts in that field. We're interested in obesity, um, particularly the origins of obesity, but also behavior change. So this ranges from um, looking at the genetic components um, as well as the social components. So uh, for example, some of our experts uh, like Claire Llewellyn looks at things like uh, the impact of um, sugar and the, the use of sugar and how we can manipulate or reduce the intake of sugar through some nudge type interventions, for example. We're interested in uh, screening and early diagnosis, and this is uh, uh, my particular uh, area of, of expertise. So here we're interested in the determinants of inequalities. Why is it that some uh, uh, screening programs have got relatively low uptake? And what can we do to improve it? And how can we reduce the social 
um, um, inequalities in uptake, the uh, what are the reasons why certain groups are so much less likely to engage with screening or why people don't um, report their symptoms in a timely fashion? Why is it that sometimes we notice there is something wrong with our bodies, but then we sit on these issues? We don't seek help from the doctor. What can we do to enable people to do that more promptly, to understand when a symptom is something that really needs uh, some medical attention, for example. Things like cancer awareness is, is very important there. I mentioned genetic components. So really important, not just um, the social determinants, but also the, uh, the genetic components, particularly when it comes to um, uh, obesity. We're very interested in that and we've got some, some uh, expert res uh, researchers and lecturers on that. Um, but it's not just chronic illness, it's also um, transmissible disease. We have uh, got some world leading research into COVID, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. This is including things like uh, uh, um, vaccine uptake, but also the impact of uh, COVID on a whole other things like general uh, um, lifestyle, well-being, um, and physical outcomes um, related to the COVID pandemic. And of course, we're interested in doctor-patient communication. And as part of our um, course, you will, uh, if you if you attend a course, you will be able to uh, shadow a healthcare worker as part of your clinical visit. Now, having said that, also very important when it comes to UCL and health psychology, we do have a strong ethos when it comes to uh, the academic emphasis. So we are interested in theory. Our, uh, our teaching is very much, uh, we will teach you how to become a research practitioner. And I mentioned that again um, later on. The course is of course accredited and has uh, recently been re-accredited last year, in fact, um, by the British Health Ecology Society. And that means that we will be able to provide you with advanced knowledge and understanding of theory and practice in health psychology. And um, that will then fulfill the stage one criteria of the British Psychology Society training for chartered membership. So we are still able to do that um, as part of our accreditation. We will also, of course, equip you with interpersonal, technical, and creative skills. So it's not just about theory and practice. Um, that includes things like um, being able to conduct effective analysis and formulation of health problems, uh, effective design, implementation, and evaluation of health interventions. And you'll learn a lot about that, particularly in also the second term. And this could be all sorts of interventions, including how to increase screening uptake or how to institute a program for people uh, for pregnant women um, to stop smoking or uh, lose weight or control their weight during pregnancy. Practical, uh, practical skills and research and critical appraisal skills, really important. We've got a critical review, but also journal clubs. So right throughout the first two terms, every week you will review papers together with your peers um, and, and that will teach you to really critically understand and evaluate the evidence base for um, different interventions, for example, or other effects around health psychology. And overall, this should then form you into a well-developed uh, research practitioner. And of course, throughout this journey, we will give you lots of feedback and guidance um, and we will provide you with a placement. So you don't just look at the uh, uh, look at the sort of learning side of things, but also are able to apply your skills in a pr practical setting, whether that's a research setting or uh, a community-based setting. Now, how this teaching takes place, it's, it's over two terms. Um, it's always on a Monday and a Tuesday. It, uh, uh, there are eight core modules delivered in two terms. These include lectures, group work, seminars, and practicals, as well as, as I said, the, the journal clubs, and they're all delivered by experts in their fields. So this is one of the great strengths is not only are you in a world leading university, but you will be taught by uh, world leaders, not just one person, but really people who, who um, research the topic that they teach you on every day and, and know everything about 
um, uh, the most up-to-date evidence in on that topic and the, the most up-to-date changes to theory, for example. We uh, offer varied assessments, and I think this is really important. This includes uh, uh, essays, critical reviews, um, group, group project, um, as well as uh, other unseen examinations. Um, and there's extensive face-to-face -face contact. And these are just some of the members of the core team. They include the program directors, uh, Professor Andrew Steptoe, uh, Leon Chahab, Sandra, of course, um, as well as a number of other module leads. Now, in terms of um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about the um, a bit more about the content, but also the career prospects of the MSc. Um, so on placements, I think this is a really important part of, um, of the journey here. We offer a placement mainly in the third term. Um, and this can take various, um, various shapes. So it can be a very intense placement of uh, maybe uh, a week or it can be uh, lots of uh, um, uh, uh, shorter engagement over a longer period of time. Overall, what we're aiming for is that you spend at least one full working week uh, as part of your placements. And here are some of the placement providers. Um, so they can be uh, individual, uh, uh, or, you know, they can be organizations, like NICE, the National Institute of Health and Care Excellent. They can be pharmaceutical comp companies such as Roche, um, various government uh, um, uh, organizations such as Public Health England, or now its successors, um, the NHS. The third sector is really important. So Cancer Research UK, Headspace, the FAR Institute. So this would be more uh, a research institute. Um, as well as several other sort of community-based organizations. Um, now, another really major component is the dissertation. So in, uh, we start our dissertation early. So from the first term, you get to choose your uh, dissertation topic and you will work on that all the way until the end uh, when you um, submit uh, a dissertation. Now, the dissertation is supposed to be written up as a mock submission, because again, we want to emphasize that this is a piece of research. And so we will try and get you to really follow the steps that somebody would take when they're trying to publish a, a research report. And of course, this is why so many of our reports are actually published. And I'll give you some examples in a minute. But before I do that, I will hand over to Olivia. Uh, Olivia, if you could tell us a little bit about you, the research project that you started last term. Yeah, so my research project is a quantitative research um, doing secondary data analysis of the Gemini study, which was done here in the UK. Uh, the twin studies longitudinally based and they've kind of followed up with them. I think the twins are like 14 now um, from birth until now with a bunch of different um, questionnaires and demographics, but I'm looking at specifically appetite behavior in childhood and how if that's related to eating disorder symptoms in adolescence. Um, and I'm working very closely with Claire Lewin and she's one of like the main um, directors of the Gemini study, which is really great because she has a really good grasp on the data and just the study overall. Um, and it's so far it's been a really good experience. You now we have meetings um, every other week. Um, her and I and I have kind of like my own personal research team and they give me some direction and feedback on where the study's going. Um, and I also can express, you know, what I'm interested in, in studying as well. And like, if we can tweak things and change things to really fit um, what I'm interested in and also what the data provides. Thank you so much, Olivia. That's really good. And hopefully uh, that, that gives you a sense of what, what uh, doing a project is is, is all about. And I just want to also, again, just come back to the fact that so many of our projects are being uh, published. And I just want to give you a little bit of a, um, a sense of, um, of the type of things. 
So there are many, many, many more papers. I've, I've taken a few out just uh, to give you a, a, a bit of an understanding. So uh, you can see, for example, there are publications uh, on uh, the main uh, uh, um, uh, research uh, areas in our department. Um, so a nice cross section, something on the association between neighborhood perceptions and mental well-being among older adults, because we've got in as part of our psychobiology group, a really strong focus on healthy aging, for example. Um, then uh, uh, another topic uh, around prevention. So are parents more willing to vaccinate their children than themselves? Um, so uh, this is a, a, a paper that was done by an MSc student and a whole cross section of people within our department. Um, smoking cessation, of course, is a very important uh, a part of uh, uh, what we do. We've got uh, the, smoke, uh, the, the smoking and alcohol uh, research group um, led by uh, one of our correctors, Leon Shahab, and uh, Professor uh, Jamie Brown. And so they are very prolific when it comes to publishing research reports. And then, of course, there is um, uh, also the a focus on cancer um, and uh, early diagnosis. So one of the papers, you can't see it very well, was um, uh, published on public perceptions of uh, the colorectal cancer screening program that was with um, a student that I supervise alongside a number of my colleagues. So it's really second nature to us to publish uh, our research reports. And, and as uh, uh, Isan and others have mentioned, it's really important because it's one of the main currencies you will have going forward, particularly if you want to do a PhD, if you want to apply for studentships and, and, and scholarships, uh, these research publications are a main uh, 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 boon to your uh, CV and strengthen your CV. So now I'm just going to say a little bit about um, uh, what happens after the MSc. And um, so there are some career destinations um, that I wanted to mention because you'll be interested to find out what can you do. And of course, Kobe also mentioned that a little bit already um, in, in terms of, yeah, sorry. Uh, what, what he might want to use the MSc Health Psychology, and of course it, it can change, but here are just some popular career destinations, including being a research associate or a research assistant. So lots of people uh, or lots of students after they leave uh, try and stay in research. And one of the first things to do there is to um, perhaps get a job as a research assistant or associate. Um, uh, and, and, and many people have done that. There are, of course, there's the opportunity to become a PhD student. And again, this might be a step sometimes after you've done an initial sort of um, uh, uh, period as a research assistant and associate. Um, of course, there are uh, really important uh, uh, alternative careers such as um, clinical psychology, uh, so becoming an assistant, uh, health or clinical psychologist and uh, going on to a clinical psychology program is, is something that uh, many of our colleagues have, have done. So I know uh, personally people that I've employed who came from the health psychology program, who then uh, worked with us in the department and then became uh, and then went on to do clinical psychology. Because as part of that, those programs, you usually need an extensive range of um, work experience as well as research experience. Um, so the combination of a health psychology degree as well, um, a postgraduate degree as well as some work experience is really strong when it comes to preparing you uh, to become a clinical psychologist. Civil servants is another uh, career route and of course also becoming health advisors and consultants. And at that point, I'm really glad uh, to be able to hand over to a, a very uh, uh, a long-standing and good colleague of mine, um, uh, Dr. Sammy Quaif. Now, Sammy studied uh, health ecology at uh, UCL and is now a very eminent uh, um, uh, researcher and lecturer at uh, Queen Mary's University. She uh, uh, did her PhD at UCL, um, and you know I I'm still uh, you know very happy to be in touch with her a lot, and I'm very grateful to her to spend a little bit of time 
talking a little bit about her sort of post MSc journey. So, um, Sammy, can you tell us a little bit about your career and, and what happened after you completed the MSc in health psychology? Yeah, of course. Um, thanks, Christian. Hi, everyone. So, um, yeah, I'm lucky enough to have been born and kind of grown up in terms of my um, health psychology education and research career at UCL. Um, and I'm going to give a sort of five minute overview of some of the um, reasons that I had for studying health psychology in the first place and also um, my sort of career since being on the course. So um, in terms of what motivated me to study health psychology specifically, um, I think it first kind of got captured my interest when I was studying undergrad psychology. And as sad as it sounds, there was a specific study on wound healing. And I remember them talking about how if you were under a high stress, um, your wounds actually healed something like three days later um, than individuals who weren't suffering stress. And it just really was a moment that clicked with me when I realised traditionally I sort of thought of the mind and the body as separate, but realising kind of the impact and how um, these things get into our biology and under the skin kind of really motivated me. And um, I became really interested in um, understanding how psychology could be applied to health having previously sort of thought about it in terms of um, mental rather than physical health. Um, so I um, kind of once I wanted to study at UCL because obviously it's, you know, got a fantastic reputa reputation. Um, the department itself um, had a real breadth of expertise across lots of different disease areas. So I was quite interested in chronic pain at the time. Um, there's lots of um, different um, areas of research with really infused um, experts that kind of mean you can sort of dip your toe in and, and learn about those areas quite easily. Um, so it helped me to think about where I wanted to sort of focus um, during that time. Um, I subsequently, um, after doing my master's in health psychology, worked as a health promotion practitioner um, in Nottingham. Um, my role was to try to support um, initiatives that reduced exposure to passive smoking and my role was very much engaging with different um, community organisations that had contact with those who could benefit from that kind of support so um, I was really I was really focused on the kind of an active practitioner role at that point. Um, I then um, wanted to sort of try my hand at research because I'd really enjoyed doing my research um, as part of the master's. Um, I'd done a project in chronic pain and I'd kind of become really interested in that. So I um, had a, uh, I worked as a, I started my time at UCL as a research assistant, um, thinking that I would quite honestly never go down the PhD route, but um, I did, I got really interested in it. It was, it was sort of very different to studying and um, I really enjoyed kind of the research culture and the autonomy that you sort of have in that role over and following your interest to a certain extent. Um, I then um, did a PhD in um, lung cancer screening participation, so understanding why those people who are most at risk of lung cancer are most likely to benefit are those that are less likely to participate. And so trying, you know, through a real kind of inequality lens, which is where my interest is. Um, and then um, was subsequently employed as a um, research associate in the same department, um, so behavioural science and health at UCL, um, started to kind of get a bit of funding for my own research projects. Um, and in the end, I ended up being at UCL for 10 years, um, and I suppose 11 if you count the masters <laughs> with a break in sort of working in between. Um, and subsequently, that was the kind of springboard for me. Um, I'm now a senior lecturer at Queen Mary University and building my own um, behavioural science group um, in order to follow sort of different streams of research and things. So I guess I kind of um, got caught the bug in terms of research um, and definitely the health psychology MSc um, was um, instrumental in doing that. It's very highly regarded. Um, and as I say, it, it allowed me to explore different areas um, and sort of develop my interests. Whereas prior to that, I kind of, I sort of knew I found it interesting, but didn't quite understand how, how it was applied and what it, what it actually would, 
would be like in reality. Um, so yeah, I hope that's um, of interest. I don't know if I'm happy. I don't know what the format is. I'm happy to answer questions if anyone wants me to, or I'm not sure if we might be moving on to the next bit in the agenda. No, uh, thank you, Sammy. There will be, I, I should say that um, if people uh, want to put questions in the chat, you, you're more than welcome to, uh, as we go along, there'll be a Q&A before long. So if you have a little bit of time to stick around, Sammy, then that, that would be great. Um, what what I would also want to say is that, that um, of course, uh, 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 Sammy is a really good example of, of, of how you then through becoming a research practitioner can really influence uh, policy. So, um, you know, so the impact that her research has had on the sort of the uh, people thinking about things like lung screening and, 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 and sort of the NHS lung screening program, but also other initiatives. So I, for example, was on a call the other day where people said, oh, they, um, this, this was people trying to think about new research studies around prostate cancer screening and they were saying that um, they really want to learn from the excellent work that has happened around sort of um, people trying to implement um, uh, lung screening and in some of the research that Sammy has done. So, so as a health ecologist you can really influence the way new programs are, are shaped and new uh, research and clinical innovations take, take place and it is absolutely important because for things even the best screening program the new new tests things that you see in the newspapers if in the end the public don't understand what they're for and if if they're not taken up it becomes a, a, a really really big issue it is uh, it is absolutely critical that that behavior and uh, sort of awareness uh, goes alongside clinical innovations because otherwise they do Sadly, sometimes fall by the wayside, and there have been instances where really uh, uh, excellent clinical interventions uh, or could have a, a massive uh, public health impact ultimately didn't really um, stay with us because uh, partly, at least partly, because of lack of public endorsement. So the work that, that we do as health ecologists is really important, and Sammy is a, an excellent example of that, and, and how in, in a reasonably short period of time, you can go from being a, a student on the MSc to becoming a leading leading light in research. So that is a really exciting case case study as well. So now that we've had all of this excitement, let me just briefly finish on on an, on a slightly more technical note, just to kind of go over some 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 uh, entry requirements. Um, so. Uh, the, the types of things that we want to see. This is a very, very competitive course. We, we are oversubscribed. Um, so uh, what we expect students to have is a, a, a degree for either from the UK institutional and overseas qualification of an equivalent standard to a 2-1. As I said, it's, it's competitive. So um, uh, not, you know, we are oversubscribed. We do also consider applications for people with a lower second class or other equivalent degrees, um, particularly or only if there is evidence of further study and, and really relevant and strong work experience. Uh, applicants are encouraged to have graduate basis of chartered membership. Now, this is again becoming very technical if you are unsure about this. Um, so most of you will, will have this if you if your first degree is in psychology. If not, they are, uh, it's uh, the best place to reassure yourself of that is by contacting the BPS. I should say that it's not, um, it doesn't exclude you if you don't have this uh, graduate basis. That doesn't mean you can't take the course. It doesn't mean you can't uh, a graduate with an MSc in health psychology. However, it might uh, mean that you don't have this uh, a stage one qualification uh, that we spoke of earlier. But again, it's not something you need before you start the course. You can also acquire graduate basis after you uh, complete the course. So um, uh, don't worry if you haven't got it now. You don't need to do it before you enter the course. 
Um, it's something you can do afterwards as well. In terms of language requirements, we uh, they are level four advanced. So uh, it's really important that uh, students can express and articulate themselves uh, very well on this course because we do have an essay, we've got a critical review, we've got a systematic review, we've got the research dissertation and students can become frustrated if, if uh, uh, if, if, if they, they struggle with that aspect. So we do, we do have um, relatively stringent criteria to allow people on the course because we know in order to thrive, it's really important that uh, you meet those requirements. And um, you should prepare a personal statement. This is really important now because we no longer interview candidates. Um, so a personal statement is really critical. And I'll say a little bit more about that. Uh, you also need references. Um, the deadline for applications is the 31st of March. Now, in terms of the personal statement, it really is sort of reflecting what we've been talking about today. If you, in your own words, can present why you want to study health psychology at the graduate level, why you want to study it at UCL, how your academic and professional background meets the demands of this program, and it is a very demanding program, where you would like to go professionally with your degree. All of these things should be captured uh, in your personal statement. As I said, this we will take this as a major contribution towards your application and deciding whether you should study at UCL. A uh, few more boring details around fees. Um, I'm not going to read them out. Uh, you can find them. Um, uh, obviously, they are different if you're overseas, they're different if you're part time or full time. Um, we do support one student with a, a Jane Wardle studentship. Oh, uh, this is uh, uh, £3,750 £3, towards your uh, uh, fees. Um, this is just for one student and the award will be given typically after you uh, uh, in, in the first, first term. But there are also other sources of scholarships available and the UCL website will detail those. Um, in terms of the start date, it will be September 2023. Uh, it's one year full-time, two years part-time. Um, and the location uh, is going to be the Bloomsbury campus. So a very thriving, very inner city campus that you will benefit from. And, and also the, the presence of lots of other institutions and UCLH and clinical environments. So uh, uh, is where you would, would uh, study at least most, most of your lectures will take place in that environment. Now, finally, in terms of extracurricular activities, I should say that we do offer socials there is uh, an opportunity to meet the department, meet members of the department, hear from research groups right at the start during induction week. Um, we uh, 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 provide a winter or resources for winter social. So uh, at the moment, we're still thinking about what we're going to do with the current cohort. Um, so that typically takes place in December or January. Um, and there is a summer social, which is very active. We usually meet in the park, lots of running around, jumping around, and uh, as well as eating pizza and having uh, lots of pims uh, in, in, um, in uh, its uh, region's park. Uh, and then, of course, it's not just the, the program itself. There's lots of other uh, institutions around UCL, the Students' Union. There are over 250 clubs and societies, including lots of opportunities for you to be active um, and um, to, to join various other societies, to volunteering. Very important ever since I've become program leader, I've been really uh, much more exposed to the work that the students support and wellbeing team do. Of course, when people start, um, uh, 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 a master's or study at university, sometimes, you know, we, we get uh, unstuck. And so there are lots of resources at UCL now to offer support with that. And of course, as a core team, we will offer a lot of support uh, to you, but there, there are also other resources available, particularly in the student support and wellbeing team. 
and there's also student advice, student union advice service. Now with that, I'm just going to show you a very brief video um, before we then start the question and answer. So this is just a three minute video, might have seen it already, but again, just capturing um, some voices from previous students. So hopefully you'll be able to see and hear that uh, video um, and I'll, we'll, we'll, we'll re rejoin after that video in a couple of minutes time. I'm Suha and I'm doing the MSc in Health Psychology. Health psychology is looking at the aspects of diseases and illnesses and the psychological, social and biological factors that are involved in that. I was attracted to this, to this discipline because I find that oftentimes in science is this kind of Cartesian dualism of like mind or body, but health psychology is kind of both of them. It's saying that yes, you can be ill, but how does that affect the way you behave and the way others behave around you and your place in society? Well, I'm really interested in sports. Um, I studied psychology in Spain, the bachelor's degree. So I was really interested in how, you know, health behavior affect, um, you know, physical, mental health, um, how they merge, um, how also sports um, and diet and those type of health behaviors um, work together and, you know, which are the attitudes of people towards um, those type of behaviors. So I was trying to um, get a more in-depth understanding of uh, everything related to health, um, psychology, and, you know, well-being. I really like the chance that we got to um, shadow a person in an actual health setting. So I got to shadow a nurse at a rheumatology ward at UCLH. And that was really interesting to see how she not only had to be an expert in her field, but she also needed to know how to communicate with people and get the best out of them them and make them understand why it's important to keep to their medication and keep coming back. Well, I think one of the main things of this course is that you get uh, both a sense of research and clinical practice um, because you have the opportunity of uh, going for placements throughout all the year. You've been offered placements as well as uh, you've been lectured by top researchers in the field. And then you have the opportunity to do a dissertation at the end of the course, which you know, gives you a bit of background of uh, both research and clinical. So I think that's the main thing of the course. You can get you know, both, both things. My name is Holly, and I'm currently studying an MSc in Health Psychology as part of an Economic and Social Research Council funded 1 plus 3 PhD. My PhD is part of a um, large dementia intervention, which is called Promoting Independence in Dementia. And my PhD will be focusing on evaluating the implementation, so how well the intervention is delivered as intended, and whether I can improve that to be more accurately delivered. I really like the fact that UCL has this global approach to education. I mean, it, it really promotes the idea of diversity in its students, and London's a perfect example of that as well. I love walking down the street and hearing like different languages and um, different people from all around the world. I'm hoping to become an academic, so I'd like to lecture and do research. Um, and then possibly in the future I might go on to work in practice and things like that. So I might do chargeship, but I'm not sure yet. So hopefully that video, um, again, sort of gave you a bit of an idea of what we are all about. Um, so now it's time for questions. And sorry for interrupting the video a few times. It's because I was trying to have a look at the, the messages in the chat. So there are uh, a few that I can see here. Um, we'll go through them. I'm mindful that Sammy is still here. So in case there's anything for Sammy, um, let's, let's prioritize those. Uh, so I'm just going to have a look at the chat. Christian, I can help out with any of the, I see that there's quite a few about the mature students there. So I'm uh, to... Yeah, no, ex excellent. Um, Fantastic. Thank you, Kobe. Yeah, I can yes. see there are a few of them. Yeah. Yeah, Kobe, do you just want to read out some of those questions and and uh, also address them as much as uh, you, you can? 
Yeah, sure. So I think France is great to hear from the current students. Are there many mature students entering health psychology from related fields? Uh, well, I, um, I'm not from a psychology background. I, I did a master's in business um, about 10 years ago in Australia. Um, I did do a um, psychology graduate diploma that got me entry into this uh, this course along with my probably my experience um, in the corporate world as well. But I think in my cohort, there's myself and one other mature student. How, yeah, I think it's just one. But having said that, <laughs> it's not a barrier to any of the benefits that you get. Um, you know, I was a bit worried that maybe I would be you know, as engaged or, you know, feel part of the cohort as some of the younger people maybe because I'm almost double the age of some of the some of the um, students, but that's definitely not the case. I'm, I get, if, if anything, I think I get more out of it from, you know, understanding how important it is to, to uh, you know, take this opportunity and learn as much as I can at the, you know, the lecturers, um, uh, including Christian and, and uh, with the support of Sandra, you know, help out as much as they, they can. And I think there's an understanding that as a mature student, you do have some different demands on your life and they're, they're very accommodating about that. So I, th I don't think that there's any, any, um, any issues from my perspective about being a mature student. I think it's, yeah, you see are very accommodating and as are the rest of the cohort, I think they, almost come to you as a bit of a, you know, a sounding board for a lot of things outside of the course as well. So that's, it's, it's nice to be able to be in that position as well. And I'm one of the student reps. So I think maybe I got chosen because I'm one of the, one of the oldest, but it is a great position to be in and help, help uh, everybody get through the course together. Uh, and, I, and I think there is a few other questions about mature students as well. Um, yeah, I, th I think I've answered Karen's question, but having said that, I, I have no doubt that um, in the future, given the state of the world, and particularly, um, you know, with the pandemic, that interest in health psychology will will continue to grow and there'll be more and more people from different backgrounds and from different age brackets looking to understand this field of study more. So I would dare say in the next year or two, there'd probably be a lot more mature students in the program. Um, and I will also say that some of the uh, courses that we we do or some of the lectures that we do, there are students from other, um, other parts of UCL coming into the course as well. And some of those people are a bit uh, more on the mature uh, end of the student spectrum as well. Uh, I think that's all the questions about mature students. So I'll hand back to you, Christian. No, thank you so much, Colby. Um, and that's that's really uh, really helpful. And as Colby said, we do have mature students on the course. Um, typically, also we do have a lot of recent graduates, so that's the, predominantly the the, the, the case. But uh, as, as Colby said, people tend to also now increasingly uh, try and train as part of their professional development um, in in health psychology so we do we do get people from other professions we've had gps on the course and as, so there are mature students um, that, that also take this course uh, and um, now just in terms of Oh, um, Christian, I would like to ask uh, one of the questions, uh, I think yeah. it was Anna, uh, regarding the English um, requirement. And I have, I'm going to share right now with Anna and with the rest of the group in case they have the same questions. Uh, there yes. are some of the countries they are, of course, part of the, they don't need to, uh, to prove the knowledge of English. There is a quite list of that in the same link. And then there are some of them, of course, they, they need to prove uh, with one of the English tests. Yes, no, no, thank you very much for that, uh, uh, Sandra. So if you can follow that link, you will be able to, to tell whether or not you would you ha would have to take this, this test. Um, 
So, uh, for example, so if if all your tuition was in English, uh, yeah, you you would have to check, but there's a good chance you wouldn't have to do it. Um, but yeah, I, best thing is to just to double double check because it might be different. Um, you know, it might vary by institution. But given that it was fully taught in English, I would anticipate that maybe you won't have to do it or you wouldn't really struggle if, if you had to take a test. Um, now, uh, in terms of, uh, there's a couple more questions from, from Anna. I'm just going to look at those. Um, yeah. So in, in, firstly, have a lot of places been uh, already been allocated? So we're still early in the application process or in the selection process very early. Um, but um, there's also another question about interviews. So I'm just going to take that right now and say that there are no interviews this year. This is for the first time. We're, uh, in, uh, we're just focusing on the, uh, on, on the application itself, which is what happens typically in our institute. Um, so we haven't started the selection process yet. We do already have quite a few applications, though. The window is open until March end of March, so it's it's a little bit longer, but not too long. Um, so I would encourage people to apply as soon as uh, uh, as, as possible, really, because, yeah, I mean, end of March is um, just around the corner, really, uh, given that we're already into February now. Um, uh, but yeah, so we haven't allocated places yet. Uh, do you have further tips on the personal statement, um, recommendations? Uh, I think there will be some some instructions as part of the application form itself. Um, I, I think it's trying to highlight your enthusiasm. I would say try and write as elegantly and, and uh, 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 effectively as possible to just also demonstrate your your skills. I would highlight any kind of previous achievements also. I mean, you, you will submit your CV, but it's all good. It's, it, it's always good to have it all as part of the personal statement. So uh, showing your personal motivation, why you want to study health psychology um, is, is, is important. Your, 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 your competencies, your previous achievements, uh, why you think you would be particularly a particularly strong candidate, and also, of course, um, what your future aspirations are. Because one of the tests for us is also, uh, if students fit, do they really <clears throat> identify with the role of a research practitioner? Um, now, we understand that lots of uh, people who are interested in health psychology might also be interested in pursuing a, a career as a clinical psychologist. And that does not just disqualify you in any way, because as I said, it's a very valid way of getting there is to do a master's like, uh, like the one in health psychology, because there are quite frankly, not that many clinical psychology masters. Having said that, I would say that you know we are very population based. We are focused on physical health uh, more than mental health. So as long as you uh, feel that the content of the course is something you can identify with, then you know demonstrating that you've got this longer interest, longer standing interest in, in being a clinical or clinical psychologist, then that is absolutely fine. But again, it's just trying to really also demonstrate that, that you understand the ethos of this a program and that you identify with it. That would be really important. How is the stu study load? Is it a bit, very busy course? Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, we've got the Monday and the Tuesday as teaching days. Um, so that will really kind of occupy all of your day. You then have the rest of the day for private study. And so we do have um, lots of deadlines. Obviously, we've got the eight modules. Some modules have got more than one assessment component. Um, uh, some of them have three assessment components. Um, obviously, there will be smaller components. Others will just have, say, one essay, for example. We have got several unseen examinations now. So we've got MCQs and SAQs, which will really challenge the breadth. So for those modules, every lecture will contribute a question. So you will really need to know not just the depth, but the breadth of, of those modules. Uh, so it is it is very challenging. Um, keeping up Sorry, with the deadlines. Sorry, 
Yes. Sorry, Christian. I, I would like to ask the students how they feel was the, the student, you know, love. Oh, organized. yes. How they, come okay. to organize, they have been organizing, you know, during the first terms and then this second term, you know, the deadlines, uh, attending the sessions, go to clinical visit, how they organize, you know, the, their time. I don't know, Olivia, or, or I, I can see Olivia in front of my. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think that it's definitely, um, like it took me a couple of weeks to get into the routine of everything, but once I was in the routine, it became quite easy and natural. And like, we have our very structured day, Monday and Tuesday. And then if I was able to kind of set out, um, specific structure for the rest of the week for myself, and I think, um, meeting the deadlines and, doing all the things that were necessary was um, definitely doable and achievable and still having a life outside of school and being able to like explore London and do all of those things. Um, a lot of times you'll meet people in the class and then the, like on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, you can meet up um, either at UCL or elsewhere and like work together, which is always nice. You're not working alone. Um, yeah. And I think that the, um, a little bit something different, at least from my undergrad degree, is like when you have an assignment in this course, like that's your kind of, at least in the first term. And so far, that's like the only assignment we've had. Whereas I feel like in undergrad, you know, you have a certain amount of courses and you can have an exam one week for one course and then an essay the next week or something like that. But this one, for this course, it's very easy to kind of like once you have an assignment, like that's all you're focusing on for that period of time before it's due. And then you don't really have to um, think about too many other things. Thank, Thank you very you. much, Olivia. Anything to add, Isan? How, how, how have you found it? Yeah, so similar to Olivia's experience, I think at the start, especially coming from undergrad, where a lot of it was online during the pandemic, I found it quite difficult to just settle in. But once a few weeks down the line, I think uh, once you organize everything very well, it's doable, especially because teaching days are Monday and Tuesday. So you do have the rest of the week to, you know, study, socialize, do every work, I guess, anything you have. But um, as long as you stay on top of everything, it should be fine. Uh, I can I can help out as well. I think that this Sorry, my dog's barking as well. <laughs> um, but from a mature student's perspective, what one thing that really attracted to me to me to UCL was um, that, as Sandra said, the courses, the, your days are really either Monday or Tuesday. And for part-time students that I've so far I've experienced that they're uh, all in the one day, which means I can still work as well, um, as most mature students will probably need to do. Um, so I can still work, you know, three and a half, four days a week and um, and get all my study done as well. It is uh, really, you need to be very uh, precious with your time, I guess, if you're a mature student, because there's a lot to take in and, uh, you know, the readings are quite extensive. Journal Club, which uh, Christian and Sandy talked about, which involves, you know, almost weekly reading and reviewing, critically appraising a journal does take up a bit of time in addition to you know, your assessments but uh yeah i think yeah it, it's doable to work a few days a week and be a um, mature student as well uh, as long as you're part-time excellent uh very good and um so the next question from Anna was um, the recognition of the MSc in other U uh, European countries. So I can't really speak uh, very much about that. I know that a couple of years ago, I um, had uh, one of my uh, academic duties was uh, a German and uh, would have gone back uh, to, to a more study in Germany, but uh, how the MSc is recognized in other European countries, I think you will need to um, need, need to do a little bit of research within the country that you're interested in. Um, I don't know whether actually, um, again, Kobe or Olivia, uh, or how much you know, or how much, uh, how, how 
relevant it is for you in terms of your sort of uh, future career uh, and, and whether you've done a little bit of uh, digging into that. Uh, do you want to go, Olivia? Sure. Um, I've done a little looking into it. For me, a master's, I think, is very recognizable across, like from the US to the UK, at least. Um, the only issue that I'm running into is if I were to go on to do a PhD, um, and I would like to do when I think eventually in like clinical psychology um, and like the licensing for that to practice in the US if I ever want to go back would be the only issue. Um, but at least for the health psychology masters, I haven't really, I think just, I mean, the fact that UCL is such a wide, like a global school, um, it's very well known that any masters can be very beneficial to you in your career. Yeah, I agree with Olivia. I, I um, I'm not going to be in the UK for forever. And, uh, I've tried to map out my future, and I, I'd say, I don't know about the other two students in the course, but I, I'd say about fifty or sixty percent of us are from somewhere else in the world, at least. And um, you know, I think the reason we're all on this course is because, as Olivia said, this is a really recognisable, well-regarded course, um, and for me, uh, going either going back to Australia or somewhere else in Asia, I I know that it is well regarded, and if nothing else, it will be a, it will get me recognition of prior learning for further study. If I want to go in and do a PhD, or if I want to finish filling any gaps that this course doesn't cover for, say, um, accreditation for the Australian Psychological Society. Um, so it's it, it's definitely transferable. I know for a fact in Australia it doesn't, you know, give me a, a blank check to, you know, um, automatic qualification for um, professional rec uh, professional registration in Australia. But it, if nothing else, it's really, really helpful. So I hope that helps. No, thank you very much. That's, that's really, uh, really good. And uh, so... John Kim asked, how much demand is there for the health psychologist role in the UK? Is it a referral service? How do people go and see a health psychologist? So that's an interesting question. Yes, yeah, so, so you don't really have, uh, you, you wouldn't necessarily go and see a health psychologist. A health psychologist can work on a consultant uh, uh, level, but most of the time uh, health psychologists get drawn into or asked by particularly by public health teams to provide support, for example, evaluating interventions. Um, uh, there are increasing roles for practicing health psychologists who might also work within, as part of a sort of public health team. Um, we don't really have anyone on the call. I don't know, Sammy, are you still on the call? I am, yes. Yes, so Sammy, do you have anything to, any any more pearls of wisdom on on that on that question, and maybe also just again explain how you um, how you get approached um, uh, uh, as a health psychologist in terms of doing research or working with 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 sort of public health teams? Yeah, so sort of the role. Yeah, so my um, my research is very much applied. So. Um, I, because at the moment, um, the UK, an organisation called the National Screening Committee in the UK have recommended a national lung cancer screening programme. So just like in the UK, we have breast, bowel and cervical screening programmes, a lung cancer screening programme is now recommended. So I've been involved in quite a few policy initiatives um, or uh, spaces. So for example, at the moment, um, I'm working um, with the Department of Health and Social Care in England to, des to design the standards that are used to judge the effectiveness of lung cancer screening. Um, so this obviously includes things along the line where different people have expertise around, um, you know, some of the clinical aspects, but my interest and my expertise is around how we uh, set standards for participation and, and equality um, in those kinds of programmes um, and also embed um, specifications that make sure that things like decision support are integrated in the right way, which is needed when you roll something out at such a large scale across so many places. Um, 
I also am an expert advisor for NHS England and um, they have a national targeted lung health check program and I guess as you sort of build up um, your research um, and findings in this kind of space you become more recognized and I think being from a health psychology um, background actually you often bring something new to those spaces because um, I've tended to be the kind of the go-to person um, in health psychology for these for this advice because I've sort of specialised and honed in on it um, whereas there might be quite a few you know respiratory medics or whatever um, radiologists for example involved so I suppose these sorts of things aren't as crowded as we try and Im embed more and more health psychology into the way that um, uh, population health and public health programmes are run but equally I mean those are sort of things where I'm approached and offered things in an advisory capacity but equally a lot of my research produces sort of tangible outputs for example um, I got funding from a charity called the Roy Castle Lung Cancer Foundation and we did some studies to build an evidence base for how you should communicate with people at their lung cancer screening appointments making sure they're prepared for the psychological for the abnormal results that they get um, that they can get, um, making sure people know how to raise smoking cessation and all those sorts of things. And we actually produced an online training module, hired a, a like back room um, in Camberwell um, studio to film some sort of um, nurse and acting nurse patient scenarios and sort of produce this training that's now um, used nationally. So there's sort of ways of doing that, I suppose, there's your own identification of needs where we saw that this communication was you know needed to be evidence-based and supported so that there was quality across the program but equally once you sort of build up a reputation in the area um often you're invited and like I say because um we're relatively few in demand compared with perhaps other specialities um I think it's perhaps easier to to have an impact and do that excellent thank you so much Sammy and and, and I think while you were talking, I also just wanted to uh, add to that, that really what that reflects is, is again, the population-based uh, aspect. So, so while we don't necessarily deal with individual people, we deal with services that might interact with individuals, but they deliver a population-based intervention. So it's typically advising people on things like um, maybe stop smoking services, whether it's um, uh, uh, health promotion teams are particularly set up to deal with uh, screening and early diagnosis, advising on, on campaigns, for example. Um, so that's where also a practicing health psychologist or a, a, a also just kind of preempt this of the clinical health psychologist or the, the, the pr practitioner health psychologist would work is typically, um, and I spoke to a colleague of mine in Scotland about this, um, uh, who provides stage two training. And so what happens is that you would, again, maybe uh, follow a similar model to the one that we use the placements. Um, so you would be placed into public health teams. And again, you would advise those services um, and, 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 and say, uh, try and come up with novel uh, strategies to reach out to seldom heard groups, for example, in a community where you know uptake of a specific service whether it's diabetic retinopathy or whether it's some, some other form of health service, um, particularly aimed at preventing disease, uh, is, is delivered and maybe not taken up uh, or taken up uh, uh, suboptimally uh, or not equally across um, the, the whole community. So um, I'm just trying to have a look uh, what other questions we, we had. Also, yes, so there was one about um, jobs being advertised as clinical uh, psychologist, health psychologist, um, uh, and then there is the clinical health psychologist mentioned. So that's interesting. Uh, can I explain the difference? Um, I, I don't uh, want to kind of... Uh, um, be, be held to, to be honest I don't I don't really uh, know that the, 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 the specific job description of a clinical health psychologist um, again as we said in the quadrant there is um, there's room for um, you know how mental health affects physical health and physical health affects uh, mental health conditions 
Um, so my sense is that again, yeah, the the clinical psychologist role would be sort of within 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 that space. Um, but I don't know whether anyone else on the panel wants to venture or uh, uh, an answer to this. Again, I don't know whether Sammy, you know anything more about clinical health psychologists. No, I mean I I know um, uh, peers of mine who've gone on to to do clinical kind of health psychology roles, um, and they've sort of tended to I guess carve their own sort of space um, in those environments. But it, you know, this definitely sort of sets you up for those those sorts of career because it gives you that strong foundation um, in health psychology. And I think usually there's other, as you were saying, in terms of the stage two training aspects that then support you in pursuing that career. But certainly I know, you know, friends of mine who've been successful there. Thank you very much. And I'm just going to move on to a question by Jackie, um, who asked whether the uh, program is suitable for graduates with an uh, MSc in psychology. Um, so, uh, or would you recommend going towards M for PhD? So, I think it entirely depends on what you're what what you're planning to do for your M Phil or PhD. So, for example, when we, uh, if if you were interested in a research uh, career, for example, in health psychology, then it would would be useful to have an MSc in health psychology. Um, it's, it's not necessarily essential, so it depends slightly on your previous work experience. But um, if you want to work in this in this space, uh, in the sort of health psychology uh, space, then it, it would be useful. Uh, obviously, an MSc in health psychology would uh, uh, sort of set you up rather well and would make you more competitive, perhaps, particularly if you apply for studentships to get uh, or onto sort of an um, uh, a health psychology relevant PhD or MPhil. Then uh, uh, just a couple more questions. Do you have to submit your CV? Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, that, that is also required um, uh, on the application form. And um, so it, 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 again, there'll be instructions once you actually go on and apply, you will see what you need to fill in to a, a performer. Um, so the CV part, it might be that you don't have to submit your whole CV, but that you just enter some relevant um, information into a UCL performer and onto the application form. Um, but I think uh, lots of people do also submit their CV itself. Um, so it definitely wouldn't hurt. Um, Sandra, do you know anything more about that? I think for last year, I'm thinking uh, we we consider you know some of the um, applicants' uh, CVs, and we were reading through you know different kind of statement and see all the references. At least we read everything uh, to have an idea who was you know the kind of students you know would apply. Yeah, I think it's important. Too much information you can bring to us is more important to take the decision. Very good, absolutely, and 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 I agree. And the CV will allow you to do this in your own way as well. Um, so while the pro forma or the application form will ask you for some of this information, it's still really useful to have the CV because you can present the information in your own way and you can emphasize certain things more easily. So so definitely, I would encourage you to submit a CV, um, and I think the system will ask for one anyhow. Um, uh, Raluca, are you going to wait until the end of the application period or do we offer places on a rolling basis? So in the past, as I said, we've changed now uh, because we're no longer doing interviews, but we have typically done this on a rolling basis and I anticipate that once we start the selection basis, we will do that. Um, but um, from, from your perspective, if you apply as, as some of the people on the panel said, it can take quite a while before you hear from us because the first step is actually not completed by ourselves, but the graduate school uh, or the admissions office. So um, we get uh, applications forwarded to us and we then uh, look at them and we haven't started that process yet. But from your end, it might take quite a while before you hear from us either way. Um, Katie uh, is getting into the doctorate for health psychology easier than clinical psychology or is it equally competitive? So the Stage two, so, so the, it's um, 
when it comes to health psychology doctorates, there are various options. So you can do a PhD in a health psychology related uh, topic, and that will then be a, a PhD in health psychology. Um, and, and there, it really depends on uh, where you apply to um, and, and whether you want to have a studentship. Then there's the professional doctorate. Um, I would say, uh, I, I can't say for certain, I know that clinical psychology is very competitive because we don't offer the professional doctorate. We don't have a program. I don't know how competitive, how competitive it is at the moment. Uh, I would anticipate it's probably slightly less competitive just because clinical psychology, at least in my days, and this is a while ago, was, was very, very, very oversubscribed. Um, but, but as I said, we don't offer it, so I don't, I don't really know what to do, uh, uh, how, how competitive those spaces are. Um, what is the format of the exams if you, have, uh, uh, if you have taken any at this stage of the year? So again, um, I, I'll pass on to the panel in a minute, but just to say, um, so we have various formats. Um, so the formats we, we have, are uh, in term one, we have an essay, and uh, as well as a critical review and a research report. In term two, it becomes more varied because we have um, a multiple choice assessment. We have a, a short answer question. So nobody on the panel would have uh, uh, done these assessments yet. Um, uh, but, but yes, so when it comes to the different types of uh, exams and how, how, how they're experienced, maybe someone on the panel uh, um, Isan, do you want to maybe say a little bit about uh, how you've experienced the assessment so far? Because you've, you've done a few now, haven't you? Yeah, so as Christian mentioned, every assignment or assessment has, um, I guess, different assessment criteria. So we've had presentations, research protocols, critical reviews, all testing different, I guess, different skills and knowledge base and it also changes in term two we have just recently submitted a statistical report for our research methods um, module and we haven't sat exams yet exams are later on in a few months time um, following a, a systematic review as well but what I've seen is every assignment is very different to the previous one. So I guess you're building lots of skills as you go along and learning to be very critical as well, instead of just having assignments that are repetitive and the feedbacks are very useful to help you your future assignments. Thank you, that's, that's really helpful. Um, uh, and, and, and hopefully that's, that's answered the question. Uh, or, or at least started to address it. Um, I think there was another question about part-timers. Um, so, so yeah, Karen, uh, you wanted to know about, um, so yes, so if you're part-time, you only have to attend one day a week. So at the moment in, in your first year, that's attending the, the Monday and then um, Sandra, can you just confirm? However, yes, I want to add during the year two, uh, the students, yep. they, are, they need to attend one day, which is uh, Tuesday, but also the student, they need to attend or they, they are going to invite to attend clinical visit, uh, which can be scheduled on Wednesdays or Fridays. And the placement can be any day when the institution is going to ask you to, to, to be as well. Yeah. Thank you very much. And, and equally for your project, of course, there will be lots of uh, touch points with your supervisory team, and we, we might be able to, uh, and, and, you know, obviously the student will have a say, and, and we will try and accommodate their preferences, but again, they can happen on non-teaching days, and most of the time they would happen on non-teaching days, because non-teaching days are, or teaching days are very, very busy, so you won't really have much time to meet people then. That sometimes there's your gap and you will have tutorials during those times. But again, tutorials is another thing that might happen outside um, and out with the Monday and yeah, the Tuesday. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but of course, some of these things can be done uh, as, as we're doing now online over Zoom or Teams. Um, but very important, the caveat around uh, placements and, and also clinical visits. 
Um, the I can see one question about um, if, so if you've applied for for a previous cohort, is it possible to reuse bits of the personal statement? Uh, yes, in theory, depends yeah. what the outcome was. Obviously, you want to have your, your statement to be as strong as possible. So if you haven't uh, accepted or been accepted and then deferred, which is a possibility, then I would definitely suggest to try and review your statement and make sure it is still competitive with this cohort. Um, there's one question, how in depth should we go about future career aspirations in the personal statement considering the word count? Very good. You, you don't have to say too much. It's just uh, maybe a general idea of what line. And of course, I think Kobe said it very well that you know his ideas uh, change all the time. And so we fully respect that. Um, so we just want to know a little bit about it. Um, uh, you don't have to go into too much detail. Thank you, Sammy. Uh, it's probably too late, but uh, I just want to also still say, uh, you know, I, I really enjoyed having her on the call and um, I, I, I'm sure you all agree that it was really useful. Um, is there a chance to submit formative assignment for each assessment? Is there plenty of uh, opportunity to receive feedback? Do the exams have mocks? Um, I think this is again another good question for the panel. Um, so, but just to say, there are no for, no formative assignments as such. We don't get you to complete an essay before the essay. There are uh, workshops that help you. There are also a sort of uh, particular sessions just on the assignment, particularly with the very first one. Um, uh, I don't know if we have mocks as such, but um, we do obviously provide lots of feedback, but uh, I, I don't know whether someone on the panel, maybe Olivia, do you want to say something about, has the feedback so far been helpful? Because I know this is always one that student, where really the student voice um, needs to be heard as well. Um, yeah, I think that the feedback has been helpful for um, the assignments that we've turned in so far, um, it's broken down into different um, like areas, like um, content, um, writing skills, uh, critical analysis, and then you kind of get a little like one or two sentence feedback about each specific area of your work and then an overall um, response to your work. And so far, I think that it's been really helpful. Um, I think it's, what you make of it, I guess, like some people may look at the feedback and not really take it to heart. But if you really like, like, okay, this is what they're looking for for the next time, I think it can be very helpful. Thank you very much. And, and uh, also there are opportunities to discuss your work with your personal, but also particularly with your academic tutor. So you will have an academic tutor on the course. So we, we have a system that's slightly different from the Institute. We have personal and academic tutors. Um, and the academic tutor in particular is someone who will see them around the time that you get feedback, particularly um, in, in term one, it's we try as much as we can to coincide with, uh, with particularly the first assignment. So you, you can discuss your work um, and your feedback with your academic tutor. People also often come to me as program director or program lead, I should say. Um, and, and also they might uh, uh, um, uh, speak to the module lead about their feedback. And going forward, also academic tutors, certainly when I see students, I tend to ask them, what about the next assignment? And, and when we talk a little bit about it, we can't give individual feedback on, on drafts, but we can advise a little bit. Also, and, just and yes, yeah. Go oh, on. Sorry, just to add on to that. Um, like, um, I met with my academic tutor pretty quickly after the first assignment because not being from here, the grading scheme is very different from the states, and they were very responsive. And we had a one-on-one -on -one meeting. I think she responded the next day, and we spoke the day after. So, people, your academic tutor and course leads are very like willing to give you um, feedback and help you with any guidance that you need. 
that's good to good to know that 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 you uh, 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 that you perceive it like that. And yes, we do strive uh, towards that. So yes, so it's in terms of feedback, then you you do get lots of written, but also verbal feedback on on your work. Um, and yes, so the exams don't have mocks as such, but we we do provide you with plenty of opportunities to discuss the assignments beforehand, and and. Uh, 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 and certainly also with the um, unseen examinations, you will get plenty of guidance on, on those uh, before you have to sit them. I think that's uh, all the questions. Sandra, um, are, um, have you seen anything else or anyone else on the panel? Any more, um, anything more to say? Thank you so much for all these questions as well from 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 the respective applicants are really useful, really good questions. No, I think I have been checking and we have responded the majority of the questions uh, all the applicants have. Yeah. Uh, yes, so there may be. Uh, oh, yes, there's one more coming up, uh, and um, uh, which is uh, is everything face to face or something done online this coming year. So we do uh, already this year, everything is face to face. There is the odd online session that is usually for logistical reasons. Um, very rare. Uh, our, uh, our intention is to provide everything uh, face to face and we do, ex uh, we do, you know, uh, monitor attendance at face to face at, at lectures and, and the journal clubs. And so we do expect students to engage in in-person sessions on, on campus. So, so having fielded all these questions, uh, we had also prepared some. Um, so just very briefly flying through that, and uh, we, we're almost at the end of the, uh, the two hours, uh, but just very briefly. So remote learning, uh, you know, it's all face-to-face. In terms of the split between seminar and lecture hours, also it's a 50 50 um, between those. Um, so each uh, lecture will have a practical element. Um, and uh, again, maybe just very briefly uh, uh, throwing that to the panel, uh, uh, maybe uh, uh, Kobe, uh, very briefly, how do you experience the lectures and, and, and sort of the balance between? sort of a, 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 the, the lecture element in the work uh, and the sort of more practical elements? Uh, I'm taking that, to, I'm interpreting that as the difference between uh, lectures and the time on campus to uh, conduct their own practical revision as well as practical sessions that are part of the course itself. Um, and yeah, I, I guess it would be that the lecture would take up one to two hours a week. You know, I think two hours is the longest lecture we had in the first term. And the practicals, uh, not every uh, lecture comes with a practical. Um, so some, for instance, the statistics uh, unit that we've all just completed had a lecture as well as a practical. So that was 50-50. However, other parts of the course, such as health behaviors, which is another unit, was two hours of just of a lecture. So I hope that answers your question. But um, yeah, no, 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 that's absolutely fine. So, so yeah, uh, we, just to kind of explain the mix between those elements. Um, so there is some practical aspects, particularly also when it comes to the research methods and, and analysis, sort of the statistical. Uh, part of the course, there's a lecture and there's quite an extensive um, practical element to that. Um, and we, we have that in term one and again in term two. And then there's uh, some lectures that are more didactic where um, you, you go attend the lecture, there's maybe a few questions, some interactive elements, and then you go away and do your private studies. And um, just to say on placements, hopefully we've already said a little bit about that. Um, just to explain that for part-timers, as we said before, that is typically in the second year. Um, and um, students get a choice, but Sandra, do you want to say a little bit about how people choose their placements? 
actually I'm started working on that and the students they will have the chance to select between three or four different options. We are trying to, you know, to allocate you in the first option, but sometimes, you know, there are some project or institution, they can be quite attractive for so many students, but um, I will try to do my best to allocate, you know, different students to different projects as they wish as well. Excellent. Thank you very much. And again, in terms of how much time you spent on the uh, on the placements, it varies. Um, so sometimes it can be very short but intense, or it can sort of spread, be spread over a couple of months when you just have shorter units of engagement. Um, in terms of part time and assignments, so you have two modules per term. So it depends on how many assignments are within that module. So in term one, you will have one assignment. Um, um, on your first module and um, on the second module, but there are some 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 modules that will have different components. Um, and uh, in terms of uh, just in case some of you are interested in, in in that side of things, so we have a large quantitative component, but we do also increasingly now uh, uh, place emphasis on teaching qualitative skills. Some of that happens in the first term, and then there's a lot more in the second term. Um, uh, sorry, Christian, I'm just checking some of the last uh, question uh, on the chat. And they said, uh, is everything face to face? I think we we confirm it's going to be the majority face to face. Uh, yeah. When does the course start? And then, of course, uh, the, the course start. Uh, I think it's the last week of September. And then the teaching will start from October. And you have to submit actually your dissertation the first week of September. It's from September to September. And in which month the placement is going to be? Uh, we try to start with the placement uh, around uh, April to June uh, during the summer. And it can last, of course, one week uh, up to, you know, three or four months, depending on the project you are going to be placed. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. And there's one question from uh, from from uh, uh, Chong about um, whether um, international students are eligible to pursue the next stage. So this is really important. And again, this is about graduate basis. Um, so in, in in theory, yes, you do have to check with the BPS what you need to do in order to be eligible for that. So certainly the masters will will be part of that. But whether your first degree uh, will give you graduate basis um, is, is something you will need to um, find out from the BPS directly. Um, so we, we, we can't tell you that, uh, but there are various ways of, of making sure that you are eligible. Um, again, we've got two international students, Olivia and Kobe. I don't know whether you know anything about that aspect at the moment. <clears throat> yes, yeah, so as I understand it, we are eligible to pursue the stage two, but it goes without saying we need to do the stage one first or we'll get to stage one and then we can, there's various pathways to get to stage two, as I understand it. And that's, uh, I believe even the BPS has got its own pathway that they run um, within that, uh, which involves, I, I believe, um, the student or the candidate sourcing their own advisor, but the BPS facilitating that pathway to stage two, but uh, you'll have to go back and check if that's still standing. But international students are eligible for stage two as I'm, as I'm aware. Olivia, I don't know if you know differently. No, I, that's a, that concurs with what I know. Excellent, thank you both. And yeah, as I said, the main thing is also to just check what the status is of your first degree. And that goes for everyone, uh, even people who have sort of non-psychology non -psychology degrees. It's just good to check uh, on the BPS website and, and maybe even contact them directly. Um, uh, sorry, Christian, they asked yes. me again about, sorry, I want to clarify about the summer. When I said uh, regarding placement, we are locating you um, in the different placement from April to June, and it can last until uh, July or September as well, depending on the project. But it doesn't mean uh, you need to attend to the sessions because during the term three, 
uh, I don't know if you want to confirm this, uh, Christian, the student, they don't need to attend sessions. They need to just focus in the project, yeah? And they will have yes. different meetings with the supervisor. Of course, you know, it's so important for those students that want to travel sometime during the summer, let us know in advance. Uh, because they have to, you know, submit different kind of elements during the during this period. They don't need to attend a session, but they need to uh, submit some deadlines and some assignment, assignment at the same time. Yes, uh, and it also very important, as you said, uh, in terms of submitting assignments and assessments. So, so some of the exams might still happen in term three, for example. Um, so there is no teaching. Um, uh, and attendance is not therefore not monitored in terms of engagement with individual modules, but there might be assessments. And of course, there'll be an expectation that you engage with your supervisory team on your dissertation, that you do your placement. Um, so all of that might still happen, but there is no more formal teaching. There are no modules apart from the dissertation module. Um, uh, uh, that's the only module that's still kind of live in, in term three. And, and so, so um, I think there's one question here also, uh, without BPS eligibility for undergraduate international students can't undergo placement? No, no, no. Uh, so uh, you can still do your MSc in house psychology and you can still do placements. The question is what happens afterwards, what you can do with your degree. Um, so whether you can do stage two, for example, um, that slightly depends on what you did for your first degree. Doesn't mean it won't impact anything that happens uh, while you are um, at UCL and doing your MSc in health psychology. So you can still do placements. So now we're on the dot of four o'clock. Um, no more questions in the chat. I've had a look at some of the anticipated questions. Um, you'll be able to see them also, I think. Um, uh, in, in, uh, but, but I think we've, we've dealt with all of them. Um, so if everybody's happy and no one has any more questions, then I'll draw this to a close with a, again, big thank you to the panel um, for, for being so actively involved. Thank you also for, Sa thank you Sandra for helping uh, uh, with Q and A's and also giving some very good answers. And I hope you all found this, uh, this helpful. I hope all of you will, will be uh, um, excited and enthusiastic and put in applications. We, 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 we love to see your applications. Um, and, and hopefully we'll see at least some of you uh, next year. Thanks, Christine. Thank you, for, thank you for your time. Yes, thank you and bye-bye everyone. Bye.